I'm really excited to present our speaker today. Uh, his name is Dr. Jeffrey Moore. He actually has worked at both of my alma maters, uh, University of Utah and ETH Zurich, so that's really cool. Um, just a short bio on him. Dr. Jeffrey Moore is an associate professor of geology and geophysics at the University of Utah. Uh, his research interests focus on processes controlling rock slope failure in situ and remote monitoring for structural health sensing and investigating the hazard and impacts of large landslides. Dr. Moore spent several years studying rock slope hazard assessment and monitoring at ATH Zurich in Switzerland after completing his PhD in 2007 at the University of California, Berkeley. And today he's gonna to talk to us about the dynamics of rock arches and towers. Uh, please help me welcome him, to him today. Thanks for having me. Nice to see some familiar faces in the room. I was here six years ago. I looked on my email on the way over here. I was here six years ago giving um, a really preliminary version of, of this talk and reporting on this work. So it's really cool to be back and uh, at a point where I feel like, you know, we, we have more concrete things to say. We've had some students finish up in the last... Um, few years, and so I'll be showing a lot of results from their research. This doesn't have to be so formal, so if you do have a question and want it answered now, you can just ask me at any time. It's okay. Um, so um, Utah, of course, home to some of the world's most remarkable and beautiful rock formations. Here you see Eagle Plume Tower. It's in Valley of the Gods. Valley of the Gods, if you know it, it was in the area of Bears Ears National Monument that was axed from Bears Ears National Monument and then restored to Bears Ears National Monument. And it's this really beautiful, uh, you do this loop drive here, you can see the road, and it goes by these spectacular rock towers. So we're used to, I think many of us, you know, are used to seeing very beautiful images of these geologic features like so. A little bit what we want to change the perspective is to allow you to view them like so. Here you see modal deformation of Eagle Plume Tower. So you just watch the first four modes of deformation uh, scroll by. So this is how the tower is vibrating every second of every day at the combination of those four modes. I will replay that. There's the first mode. Oh, that's just, and here comes, nope. there is the first mode. There's the second mode, okay. And we skip through in the third mode. Okay, so this is something that's very much real. It's happening all the time right now. The, the tower is doing that. It's just not something that we can experience. We can't hear it, see it, feel it, or anything. So it doesn't make it less real. It's just that human senses aren't tuned to that. So this is one of the messages that we want to bring out of this work, that these rock features are really dynamic and lively and responsive. To get there, I'll start with just a really brief primer on structural dynamics. Um, you know, the first one point I already mentioned, you know, all structures are constantly vibrating. They're doing that at what we call their normal modes or their resonance modes. I'll use those terms kind of interchangeably. On the right-hand side, you see a, a picture of the Campanile Tower from the Berkeley campus. And you can see, you know, at the time they put different seismometers at different levels in the tower and um, could measure the modal deformation at different frequencies. And so you see the north-south and the east-west directions. And the first mode is about at 0.8 hertz. So a hertz is one per second, so that's 0.8 times a second. And it's as you might imagine, it's a tall building swaying back and forth in mutually orthogonal directions with a, with a deflection pattern that is very well described by cantilever. Um, so we can use analytical solutions for cantilever to describe that. So everything's vibrating, and the natural frequencies of these resonance modes are very simply a function of the geometry and material properties of the structure. So here you see Castleton Tower. It's about as high as the Campanile Tower. Very different in composition, but by chance has the same first resonance frequency of about 0.8 hertz. And it's in the next one's at about one hertz. So it's doing, you know, 0.8 hertz is vibrating like this, and one hertz is vibrating like that. Next mode, it's going to be a torsional mode about a central axis. So the point of this being that if we can measure these resonance frequencies and understand these resonance modes, what we have established is this kind of structural fingerprint. 
Um, and again, it, the, the resonance modes are, property, uh, are a function of geometry and material properties. In material properties, it's just stiffness and mass, or density and, and Young's modulus. So if we establish this structural fingerprint, then we can also look for changes in the structural properties of these landforms by re doing a repeat measurement. So we can measure the structural fingerprint, do this pro process of what we call modal analysis, and then we can come back and measure again, and we can say, well, has anything changed? And if anything's changed, then it's because one of these things has changed, geometry or material properties. So that's the setup. Here's what it looks like in the field. We measure ambient vibration of rock landforms of all types. We started out doing arches, and here you see two arches in Arches National Park. Surprise Arch, which is in the fiery furnace, and then landscape arch, this is a view that not so many folks get. This is underneath landscape arch. We do this, we measure vibration using seismometers, compact three component seismometers, just same instruments they use as seismic networks to record earthquakes. Three components meaning, the three mutually orthogonal components, meaning we get two horizontal components oriented north, south, and east, west, and then one vertical component. And we set, and here you see the seismometer, it's that green can, uh, very expensive green can, sits underneath that $5 blue bucket, which we bought at Walmart, <laughs> which is a water cooler. Um, what that does, it just keeps wind off the sensor from, it's like a microphone in a way, if you put a microphone cover on it, you get a much better, lower noise threshold. So we record continuous ambient vibration for a minimum an hour, but lots of times we like to leave the sensor overnight. Uh, but it doesn't much matter. The sensor just sits on the rock. And um, when we're done, we pick it up. And there should be no permanent marking, no scarring, no damage to the rock surface. If we want to measure again, we can do that very simply by returning to a similar spot. It's not like it has to be back in the same exact spot if you, if you would measure again. Uh, here you see my student Paul, again, at Landscape Arch, and then this is uh, one of my former students, Allison, at Surprise Arch. Um, here's just some more images just to show you what it looks like in the field. This is Riley. She just finished. Um, it was a very cold and windy day there. This is called Barrette Arch. It's located near Moab. Um, and then this is Rainbow Bridge, and I, sh I presented to show you a bit the scale. Sometimes it's really easy to walk out on an arch to make this measurement. It's just like being on a sidewalk. You just have to you know, not lose your head about where you are. Um, sometimes it's a little bit more technical. Here working at Rainbow Bridge, we had to repel from this position onto the bridge. We had to ascend some ropes. But in general, the idea is to get on the structure that we want to measure and set a seismometer there, leave it overnight. And that should generate the data we need. Sometimes it gets a little bit more involved. So this is Kat Bollinger. She's our amazing like, technical lead. Um, she works as a climbing ranger at Rainier. And every now and again in the off season, she calls me and says, hey, I'm passing through Utah. Do you have anything you want me to do? And I come up with these, these dream ideas. And I say, yes, Kat, please. You know, in this same trip, she measured here. This is Eagle Plume Tower again. She measured here. She measured uh, North Six Shooter Tower. Um, if you know it, which has a very stiff climbing route, and um, another tower in Arch Canyon, which is also in Bears Ears. So the, the, everything in, from the field fits in one of these blue boxes and weighs about 25 pounds. So Kat has to haul them up, and here you can see now she's rappelling with it with, uh, in tow. So when she goes up to get these on top of the towers, then it's just a matter of sitting with the instrument or leaving it overnight. But you know, basically, if you're going to stay with it, you have to just sit still and not do anything for an hour, which is also in itself not a bad occasion. <laughs> OK, so that's all about how we generate data in the field. The data that we create from these seismometers consists of ambient vibration, continuous ambient vibration measurements. So if you would look at this in the time domain, it's just, you know, it measures velocity natively, but it's just up and down motion. And we have the three components. You don't learn much. Maybe there's an earthquake, and you would say, oh, that looks like an earthquake. Where the data really come alive is in the frequency domain. And here you see the, the power spectral density plot for data from Rainbow Bridge. So there's two things being shown. In red 
is the sensor rab C, station code rab C, that's on the bridge. And in blue is rab D, that's on the canyon floor. So that's like a local reference. It's just a really easy way to demonstrate that some of the features that we measure on Rainbow Bridge are not also measured on the canyon floor. So we're looking at two spectra. We see the north-south component on top and the east-west component on the bottom. And so that's you know, how, the, how the tower is moving in the north-south and east-west directions. I didn't show the vertical here, but that data is also available. On the station that is on Rainbow Bridge, RAPC, you can see some very tall and proud spikes that show that, OK, at 1.1 hertz, at 2.2 hertz, we have a large increase in power. And that carries on. And those same spikes we don't see on the canyon floor. How, you can think of this like a sound spectrum if you want. If I play a piano key or a, or a guitar string, if I strike that, it produces a series of tones. And you know, it'll produce a series, one lowest tone, the fundamental frequency, which is a string sort of vibrating up and down like so. And then it'll produce a second overtone, which is a string vibrating like so. And that in the middle is a node point of zero deflection. And then a third tone would have two node points, and a fourth tone would have three node points, and so on. And you would look at the sound spectrum. It would not consist of just one frequency. It would consist of multiple frequencies. And you would be hearing all of those. And in very much the same way, natural rock arches and towers are doing the same thing. It's excited now by seismic energy from the Earth. It's excited by the wind. Um, but it is all the time, like I showed you in that animation in the first slide, all the time vibrating at this combination. All of these modes are happening all at the same time. So if you set a seismometer down on it, you might see motion that looks like so. But with this frequency domain decomposition, we're able to say, OK, now, at 1.1 hertz, it's going like this. And at 2.2 hertz, it's going like this, and, it, you know, and so on and so on. And this is, again, this process of modal analysis. So what we have from the field is a set of data. I should back up. In the field, we have really limited access to where we can put a seismometer. Sometimes, rarely, we can put them at many places on an arch and generate a lot of data that way. Here at Rainbow Bridge, this was the farthest they would let us go. In fact, they offered to put in like a bolt ladder so we could go on top. And I said, no way, do not do that to Rainbow Bridge. But we didn't, we didn't need to go further as well. But this is, this is as far as we could go. So we got one sensor on the bridge. And we want to like reconstruct this whole field of all this dynamic movement from one sensor. So you can think of this in a way as a very limited set of experimental data. And we have almost a hypothesis that says, OK, these are the natural modes of vibration, 1.1, 2.2, 2.5 hertz. We don't know too much about what they represent. So we bring that hypothesis to a numerical model. And we try to then use the model to simulate those modes and see if that matches our field data. In order to get there, we have a little workflow like so. It starts with photogrammetry. Um, we do this from using drones. And in the parks, of course, you can't use drones. Um, so we do this using um, these, you know, a camera mounted on a long tree trimming pole, which is super silly in the field because it's like giant. Um, at Rainbow Bridge, you can't really see well, but on the top, there's a kind of a, a spot that you couldn't see for anywhere on the ground. So there's, if you look at the model, there's a big hole in the bridge. So just last summer, they um, brought us out to finish the model, and we brought a helium balloon and a GoPro, which was just you know spinning like crazy at the bottom of this helium balloon. But every now and again, it would stabilize, and you can control it from the phone. So we just smash and take some pictures. And so we could get enough photos from, from the GoPro up there to fill in that hole and to fill in the pieces that we needed. It was crazy because we brought this like you know 100 pound tank of helium out there and this giant balloon, and if they would just let us fly a drone, we could have been done in five minutes. <laughs> the whole thing done, you know. And the drone's this big, but so it goes. Play by the rules. So we generate these uh, photogrammetry models from 3D. Um, pho um, these 3D models. We have a lot of them. We have a Sketchfab site where we share those. 
And then we have to turn those into solid objects, uh, trim away some of the parts that don't matter for the deformation field, and we bring those into a finite element uh, simulation software called Comsol Multiphysics, um, and we ask it to predict the uh, resonance modes of each structure. So in order to do that, you have to tell a model the material properties and boundary conditions. Modeling is always a great way to understand what you don't know about your system, because uh, it forces you to like actually put something down. So we have to choose in these models what areas of the arch are fixed. You know, in Rainbow Bridge, it's easy. OK, that left ped the bottom pedestal there, that's fixed. But like, where's fixed behind that crack? You know? So we have to try out some different things there. And then we have to give it material properties. We give it density and a Young's modulus. That's it. That's all we give it. And we, we, we march forward with the assumption of uniform material properties and see how far we get. If we don't use uniform material properties, the number of nodes explodes, and this becomes you know, a really dire modeling problem, which I'll show you a solution for in a minute. Um, so then the program, it doesn't use any time domain simulations to like put in white noise or an earthquake or anything like that. It's just this eigenvalue problem. It says, you've you know, given me a geometry, you've given me material properties, here is how the structure would want to vibrate. And you can think of that cantilever tower again. That's an analytical solution for that eigenvalue problem. Um, and so at Rainbow Bridge here, then we have, you know, um, I don't have my mouse. Well, anyway, we have, we have the geometry in A, and then we march from B, C, all the way over to I with the different modes of vibration. You can see the first mode of vibration of the bridge is it sort of bending in its like out of plane dimension. Uh, the second mode is, is very similar. It's like that kind of guitar string analogy, except that it's this tall sort of freestanding bridge. Uh, third mode gets, it's a bit of an in-plane deformation. It starts to get a little more complex in modes four, five. They're doing combination things. Mode six here is actually a torsional mode. It's a whole lintel just going in torsion, and so on. These are the modes that we were able to match against our data. How do we match against data? We match in two ways. You can see in black, uh, is the modeled frequency, and in gray is the measured frequency. So those should match, and they should match like, well, they, they, those need to match. The second thing that needs to match is the modal vector, the displacement vector. So at 1.1 hertz, the bridge is vibrating like so. So I measure here on the side, that displacement vector had better look like this in my data and the model. And that's what the polar plots are shown. They're, also, stereo plots, if you prefer, um, they're showing a match between the model and the data in terms of this, um, this modal vector. So at that frequency, now we have basically one description of the ground motion from our data, and we're trying to match that from our model using a point queried at the same place the seismometer is. So that's a match. That's good match in our case. You can see that you know, not everything's a perfect match. Um, and in fact, this torsional mode down here in G, mode six, we didn't measure. So you can see it's, it's blanked out. There's no, there's no measurement on that. Why is that? Probably it's a very weak mode. It's being sort of swamped out by something that's stronger and nearby. So it's just not, it's not poking up in that spectra. It's probably there. I hypothesize it's there, but we're just not able to measure it. Potentially, if we went to a different location, we'd be able to measure that one more strongly. So this is our process of modal analysis. We generate ambient vibration field data. We query that data for frequency and polarization metrics. And then we make a 3D model. And we try to match the field data in the 3D model using uniform material property assumption and hope it works. And it doesn't always work. Uh, certainly, there's been cases I really wanted to work that don't always work, but it does work often. And sometimes, you know, we only here we matched four modes. This is Eagle Plume Tower again. Same kind of thing. Now we have the again the the measured and modeled frequencies, and then the uh, polarization vectors shown with the inset polar plots. Um, and you can see that we have generally a very good match. Um, you know, B. You can see that the frequencies don't match as as closely as we like. But we, we march forward with this and say, okay, you know, the model has a lot of assumptions in place. 
uniform material properties, you know, no major discontinuities, but it's doing a good job at least of telling us like the basics, the essentials of what these modes are. So now moving from data, which was from one seismometer on the top, we have this really clear description of the vibration of this feature. Um, we do that for arches, towers, and even other things. Here's the Matterhorn. You might know it. Um, yes, we had a seismometer on the Matterhorn. That arrives there by helicopter. They just shoot up in a helicopter and step out with a thing, and there's their seismometer on the Matterhorn. Uh, there was actually, we had actually uh, four, so you can see on the picture right, there's one on the summit, one at the Solvay Hut, uh, one on the Horn de Grat, and then a reference down in the bedrock below. Um, and this, this is the Hornley Ridge route, which is the main climbing route on the Swiss side of Matterhorn. Um, and then here you see, again, very familiar story, um, data and model and how we are able to you know, match that. And we had a lot of assumptions or questions about material properties for this you know, large scale mountain feature, how we would simulate them. And we tried lots of different things and it came around to the basic uniform material property assumption was the best. Now you can ask like, well, is that the property for like the skin of the mountain or the interior core of the mountain? It's, 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 it's not the skin, you know, it's, it's gotta be like a property for the core of the mountain that we're, that we're arriving at. But we tried to have one of these, you know, to let it vary with depth using different approximations. Didn't much matter. That's what it looks like to set up a seismometer on the summit of the Matterhorn. Um, it, in this case, it's not under a bucket, it's under this like a blue foam that you use for insulation, you know. You can cut that in the field and glue it on to make a little box, keep your seismometer safe. So that was a lot of fun. Um, but, you know, this is a big setup about modal analysis, but the question is why are you doing this? Well, obviously I think it's really cool that we're doing this, but the reasons we're doing it are, are actually here. And this whole project started with this idea of structural health monitoring, which I led on to originally. If you can establish this structural fingerprint um, through a process of modal analysis, now you're set up to remeasure that and search for changes in structural conditions over time. So this is, you know, we think exceedingly relevant for Utah's national parks and monuments where we have prominent culturally valued rock landforms that are in varying states of stability. This is Two Bridge, which is on the Navajo Loop um, in Bryce Canyon. And yeah, I know you can't get this close to it normally, but the bridge is a wreck. If you, these fractures that go through, there's, there's even, there's that big hole in the abutment, but there's like a smaller one. It, it's nine meters across. It is a small miracle that this bridge is still standing there. And then you can see that that boulder at one time came and just smashed into it and it's kind of leaning against it. Um, so this is the kind of landform, you know, that, that this was developed for. And then the idea is that, that land managers are gonna, you know, have questions around these. You know, their, their, their mission is to allow people to see them and to conserve them. And those two can sometimes be at odds. And so our idea is to help provide data to help them, you know, with this management of these landforms. So, but I wanna talk a little bit about structural characterization. It wasn't really our goal when we got into this, but in fact, we've learned a lot about characterizing rock landforms from these ambient vibration measurements. I said it works often, sometimes, sometimes not. This is like a selection of once things that worked 17 arches on the left, 10 towers on the right. These are all occasions where we had a good match between excellent field data and our model. And in doing so, we arrive at this funny parameter which we never anticipated, which is a kind of global description of the Young's modulus for the rock mass. Now, again, there's only two properties that we vary. There's density and Young's modulus. Well, density is gonna vary between, you know, plus or minus 10%. So not by much. And we could be a little bit wrong on density, but plus or minus 10%. But Young's modulus for a rock mass at the scale of a 100 meter rock tower, you don't know, I don't know what it is. We can measure Young's modulus in the lab on a core piece, right? But that's the best piece of rock we have. Once you start to incorporate fractures and make this into a rock mass problem, well then it becomes very, very hard to measure the, the Young's modulus or the, the deformation modulus for that. So somehow through our 
calibrated modeling procedure, we arrive at this Young's modulus estimate. You can see that it's generally between one and 10 gigapascals for various sandstones. On the bottom, we have, in this one, we have different formations, you know, Cedar Mesa, Navajo Wingate, kind of all kinds of familiar formations. And if you look at the Navajo, we have lots of arches from the Navajo um, sandstone, small ones like Arsenic Arch uh, near Hanksville, and you know, very large ones like Rainbow Bridge is RAB. Um, interestingly, you can make out a small trend where the largest arches tend to have stiffer, um, or a larger Young's modulus tend to be stiffer. Why is that? You could imagine possibly that it's a survival bias in the way that you know, something is stronger locally about that rock, or it, let's say this, maybe it, the cementation is different, and that makes it in the net a little stiffer, but it also allows it to like survive as a longer form longer. Uh, there's, it doesn't have to be a direct correlation between stiffness and strength. You know, stiffness is, a, is an elastic property, um, but, but here I think you're, you're seeing that. And then also you can see about the same um, for the towers, the largest are on the left, so that's Castleton Tower, Eagle Plume Tower, which you saw. Those have you know, uh, much higher Young's modulus, calibrated, back calculated Young's modulus than some of the smaller towers. So I think it's the same kind of phenomenon we're witnessing there. Um, we do this at other places too. This is Courthouse Mesa. Oh no, that's glitchy. Um, it's a 500 meter long crack that runs along the uh, north. Right now we're headed north in the drone um, along the edge of this mesa. It's near Courthouse Spring is down there on the right. The video will stop, don't worry. And then the, air, the Moab Airport is just off to the north here. Um, and so this is a great place to work because as you can see, it's really like safe and easy to walk out there. Uh, well, the, the picture on the right looks very dire, but it's, it's, it's not, I promise. <laughs> um, so in fact, what we were able to, so here we have this 500 meter long crack and you can trace it across and you can see with your eyeballs, it's, it's in trotted sandstone and it cuts through uh, this white cap rock, um, but, but it, it kind of cuts through in any which way. It's not really paying much mind to the cap rock. The question is how deep is the crack, right? And so how are you gonna find that out? Well, you can, we lowered a, you know, a wrench down there until it got stuck, and then it got stuck, and then it got stuck again, and then eventually it's still down there. <laughs> uh, and when the crack gets so narrow, you can't measure it. Or if it, like, what if the crack goes down and it jumps, and then, well, so you can't measure it. So how deep is the crack? Why does that matter? Well, it matters, you know, for the volume of the instability, for one. And then another question, is this, is this thing separated into different compartments laterally along the crack? You know, is it going to, could just the one end fail and not the other end or there's these different compartments? So this is a case where we could do um, an array-based modal analysis. So we used an array of these nodal geophones and we had 24 of them in a line going from south to north along this crack. And um, we can then directly measure these different modes of vibration uh, from this array data. And that's what you see in the, the panels here the different um, colors, and the purple especially is the field data. Um, and then the different colors are a series of results from over 1,500 numerical models where we varied the crack boundary conditions at depth. And that's where you can see in these little panels here, these different squares. So we had all these, we built this model and we allowed all these different like patches that we could turn on or off, fix them or let them free. And through a grand series of models, we tried lots and lots of different combinations. And then we can just ask, well, what fits our data best? And this is, you know, kind of a, almost a probabilistic way. Well, the best 10% of models have boundary conditions like so, and the best 1% of models have boundary conditions like so. That's the best fit to the field data. And then the best model has this kind of description of boundary conditions. So we think this is a pretty good way. You know, 1,500 models is not fast, but it could have definitely been automated in um, retrospect. And the field data just took a day. 24 nodes left overnight, that's it. Um, so I think a cool result. Tabernacle Hill, um, probably a lot of you know Tabernacle Hill, a lot of tubes well near Fillmore. Uh, features these really cool skylights, um, also very accessible on the ground surface. Here we have an array of, oh shoot, I forgot. There's 40 some nodal geophones in these 
different lines that go over this roof. And so the idea is, you know, can we measure the, the, the modes of vibration of this lava tube roof? Um, in fact, we can. We could measure the first three modes. So you see in panels C through E, it's just these, these are the modal vectors, you know, for the different modes. Um, then when we try to match it to our model, in fact, the only way we could get this to work is if we reduce the Re Young's modulus in the areas specifically around the windows. If we didn't, it didn't do any good job at all of fitting the field data. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that the rock is more fractured around the windows and has a lower modulus. It's about a tenth or a fifth, I forget exactly. That's pretty intuitive, right? I mean, it's already fractured. The, you know, the, the roof is collapsing to create those windows. Um, but this is another kind of structural characterization output that we sort of didn't anticipate when we started this work. Here's why we really got into this. I have to tell you, Landscape Arch was on my mind when I was in Switzerland dreaming of making this project. Um, and we actually did go on to the top of Landscape Arch once, but just over here. Um, basically, nobody, none of us wanted to be up there. Um, you know, there's all these, these tales from a lot of the climbers who have been up there, and it seems ill-advised to me. And in fact, we didn't need to go up there. We could measure actually from the bottom of the arch very well. Um, if you know Landscape Arch, if you've been here a while, you know that um, there was a partial collapse of Landscape Arch, this bite you see on the right-hand side, in the 90s, in the early 90s, and one of it was caught on video, it was this like explosive detachment of a slab from underneath um, the arch, and folks were videoing it because they could hear it cracking, and, um, and then it just poof, fell off. At the time, the Park Service had to decide, you know, do we keep, there's a trail that runs under the arch, and it's fantastic under the arch, it's amazing. The arch is so big. But, so it used to run underneath the arch, and you could sit in a little alcove and look out at the landscape beyond. So, but the, art, the Park Service had to decide, do we want to keep this trail open or not? And ultimately, they decided to close it. Um, but this was a big motivation. You know, when they, when they make this decision, I guess our goal is to help provide data for this decision. Because well, how did the data come otherwise? You know, you'll see, well, there was a collapse. Is there another one? I don't know. And, and some of you folks have been, probably been involved with questions like that. You know, is this continuing? And you'll be called in to answer that question. You know, well, okay, we'll keep watching. So our idea is to provide data. So that's why we really established this project early on. And many of you know that, you know, just up the trail from Landscape Arch was Was Wall Arch. It collapsed in the night of August 4th, 2008. Was one of the largest arches in the park. And the trail used to run directly under it. Collapsed in the night when nobody was there. Um, summer season, there would have been lots of people there during the day. Um, so same story, it's to try to establish a means of structural health assessment and monitoring to arm managers with data when they face difficult decisions uh, like is this arch collapsing, is this you know, behavior bad for an arch, should we close or open a trail? Here you see Rainbow Bridge again, back to Rainbow Bridge. The red curve is from March of 2015. It's what I showed you earlier. The green and blue curves are from 2017 and 2019, and we have another one that we added from this last summer, 2023. Notice the pandemic gap um, from the same site. And um, down, you see a little white spot. That's me measuring on the bottom of the arch. So in the, in the later two, we didn't have to go on top. We wanted to see if we could do this from the bottom, and we, and we could. So. Um, so basically, you can see that there's no change in any of these resonance frequencies. To within the limit of our the resolution of our detection, there's no change. And so that tells me that there's been no mechanical change, no permanent mechanical change in the arch. And as a... Scientific measurement, that's kind of a boring outcome, but as a, a measurement or a result to pass on to a park manager, that's a nice thing to be able to share. And I don't know what happened in these years. You know, maybe there was an earthquake that wasn't. Or maybe, you know, a helicopter landed on the arch. Very well could have happened. Yahoo's do that all the time now. And they're wondering, they have this back of their mind, did that damage the arch? And so now we, you know, we, at least we have something to come back and say, okay, we don't you know, see any permanent change. Interestingly, what we have seen over the years is a lot of seasonal changes in resonance frequencies. Um, this is Aqueduct Arch. It's located south of Moab, near Hart's Point, um, near Canyonlands. 
And what you're looking at is frequency on the uh, y-axis and air temperature on the x-axis, and that's a year of data. Um, and you can see sort of two trends out of this. Number one, you can see a direct relationship between frequency and air temperature. So as air temperature warms, the rock heats up and begins to expand. As it does so, it presses against its own rock grains and microcracks. And in doing so, it gets a little bit stiffer. This is like the seeding phase if you're doing a compression testing. You know, you'll seed it in and then you'll squish it and you'll get a little tick up. So this is this what we call stress stiffening. And this is an annual change, 10% in frequency equates to about a 5% change in elastic modulus. But you can see on the other side of this, when temperatures drop below freezing, we also get a stiffening effect, which you're already guessing is about ice. And I believe it is indeed about ice. If you will be out there in the field, you'll think to yourself, there's no way there's any water in this arch. But I can basically assure you that there must be some. And I don't imagine that it's saturated by any means, but I imagine that you have this kind of uh, bound water at, at grain boundaries that creates, you know, existing there a little meniscus of water. And then when it freezes, it sort of stiffens those individual grain boundaries. And in the net, we can measure that. So these are actually daily loops. So as it freezes overnight, it goes up. And then um, as air temperature warms, sort of the frequency stops going up, and then eventually frequency drops. So those are actually daily loops of freezing and thawing. Um, so lots of reversible action in terms of, of material property changes over the years, but no permanent change noted in this kind of data. OK, I got to carry on quickly to my other examples. This is a whole, this was a whole other PhD. And um, part of the other reason why we're doing these kinds of measurements, and it's all about vibration risk assessment. In the area of Moab and South Eastern Utah, people do one of everything. Um, you know, here's a guy landed his $3 million helicopter on top of Pritchett Arch uh, near Moab and made a big stink. As you can imagine, you know, that's a bad idea. Um, he'll say, well, my helicopter doesn't weigh very much compared to the rock. And I'll say, yeah, but the arch didn't evolve, you know, in the presence of helicopter landings. It evolved in response to its environmental forces, which were wind, earthquakes, temperature changes, and, and so on. Uh, here on the left, you see Musselman Arch. There's nine people or so on the arch. Um, you know, the Park Service now asks you don't walk on the arch, but, you know, at the time, the question was, well, allowing people to walk on the arch can be a really formative experience for them. That, that can, you know, they want to build experiences that connect people to land. But we don't like nine people, and then those nine people are going to jump for the photo, of course, next. Well, that's not good. Nine people, so what would you write? You know, one person at a time may jump on the arch. <laughs> And then, of course, at Musselman Arch, you know, that's, you know, people drive a car across, people drive motorcycles across, bikes all the time. So that, you would say, is bad. That may be question mark, and so on. And then here's just a promo shot for a new Bell helicopter, and that's an arch called Solitude Arch. It's next to the Green River. Um, and, okay, so we have Wilson Arch on the right-hand side. It just happens to be near a road where trucks have been passing for the last 70 years. So that can't be good for the arch, but how would you quantify that? How bad is that for the arch? And so these are the kind of subtle and difficult questions that we've been trying to get after. Helicopters. Can helicopters excite residents of arches? I was asked this question in 2015 about Rainbow Bridge, and my first answer was no. That's a crazy question, no. It was not at all crazy. It was a very astute question. Uh, as I looked into it, I learned a lot more about helicopters, what they do. Helicopters produce infrasound. It is the strongest sound they produce, but you can't hear it. You can experience it sometimes through a rattling of a window or a floor or a chair or whatever. Sometimes you can kind of feel your chest like rattle, rattle a helicopter comes by. This is infrasound. It's their strongest sound. Two-blade helicopters produce infrasound at 13 hertz. Three-blade helicopters produce infrasound at about 20 hertz. Four blades, 27 hertz, and so on. It's a function of the number of blades on the main rotor and the blade pass frequency. If an arch has those same natural frequencies, it will respond in resonance to that energy. So if it has a 13 hertz mode and I hit it with 13 hertz energy, 
in these moments, it's going to shake a lot harder as this passes by. So at Two Bridge, we did a measurement, you know, um, and we, you know, it was like a, a thousand, it shook like a thousand times stronger as the helicopter passed than it did just before, or just after. Now that passage was high and far, and it wasn't like it was damaging itself in that moment. The, the, the shaking was still relatively light. But then, okay, as you bring the helicopter closer and closer or do whatever you're gonna do, it gets stronger and stronger. So we did a whole study on that. We learned a lot, I'll show you in a minute. Um, here's an example given by, this is the March 2019 Paradox earthquake. This is a uh, Bureau of Reclamation injection facility. They put salt water deep underground to keep it from entering the Colorado River. It makes earthquakes, made a big one in 2019, and these points are all arches, and I reckon this is the, some of the strongest shaking that these arches have felt in at least decades. They are not too, they were not constructed in this seismic environment. What we found is that when there's an earthquake, an arch can vibrate, will vibrate up to 100 times stronger than bedrock just over there. And that's because its resonance modes are being excited. So this is Musselman Arch again, you see there. I'm running short on time, so I'm gonna go. Then we asked about roadway vibrations. I showed you about Wilson Arch. Well, this is an arch, was an arch, in Arches National Park called Rainbow Arch, no relation to Rainbow Bridge. Very small, slender, beautiful arch near the visitor center and about 180 meters away from the highway, but also away from the uh, train track, which carries potash and uranium um, waste or tailings uh, waste from the UMTRA site. And so we asked like, does, did the proximity to these vibration sources somehow possibly hasten the collapse of the arch? And again, these are difficult questions because a long times, subtle sources, not anything instantaneously huge. So we had to construct this kind of um, analytical model to test these ideas. We had to generate a lot of data in different environments, like quiet and noisy environments to construct like, I mean, we made these um, magnitude cumulative frequency plots for PGV in one minute intervals over a whole year at two different sites. And so basically then we could take a, this analytical beam arch with a crack in it and put it in these different environments and asked how fast that crack grows in these different environments. And specifically, what's the change in crack growth rate between these different environments? So on the top, you see, well, if you happen to be near a road, uh, 1.0 is the normalized distance that Rainbow Arch was from the highway, that over a year, you get a 1% increase in crack growth rate. No, crack growth, crack length. So that's not a lot, but that's the thing that compounds, of course, and it compounds the way that over 20 years, it's about 20% longer, and so on. And if you're a little bit closer, well, now it's, you know, three and 6% per year, okay? So that's actually getting to be relatively substantial. The middle panel, you see helicopter flights. So we added, we took this annual PGV time series and we added in a helicopter flight. And we asked, well, what changes? Then we added in 10 helicopter flights or, you know, in fact, um, what we have, you know, 30 and 300 and 30,000 helicopter flights. And if that number sounds ridiculous to you, I look at what they're flying at the Grand Canyon. They have permits for a huge, huge number of flights. So it's actually not an outrageous number. And now you can see that the crack growth lengths are not, you know, percents. They are, they are factors. So it can get substantial. And then we added in an earthquake and, and um, gave this amplification factor based on what we measured. So it took a long time and a long way to get here to try to address these subtle questions. Do these you know, moderate magnitude vibration influences affect the stability of arches? That's what the question that the park managers would ask. I was asked that question at Rainbow Bridge, at arches and so on. And I always have to say, you know, that's a very difficult question to answer. And I was unhappy with that answer. And um, at least, you know, so we, we, we launched this full scale study on it and ha took a lot of assumptions, a lot of data to get here. But at least we're beginning to like be able to provide some quantitative response to that. These are my last slides. I'll skip through them because I'm out of time. Um, you know, there's a lot of public engagement stuff which has been tremendously fun. We didn't anticipate it. Um, that's Owachimo Bridge in Natural Bridges. Um, we've done a lot of outreach. 
we, you know, there's been a lot of interest from the media, which is great fun. It's so fun to have like a, a positive story in ge geosciences to tell people and not always gloom and doom. Um, what was really unexpected is we, we started taking these vibration records and turning them into sound and we speed them up by like 10, 20, 40 times and these um, you know, infrasonic frequencies become sonic and so humans can experience this and so some of them turn out to be really beautiful in combination and some of them not so beautiful. Um, so it's really fun to like query these. We have a website where we share a bunch of these. And in fact, we, um, I was yesterday in Denver, there was an opening of an art exhibition and in that little bench plays um, audio from eight uh, landforms in Southern Utah. Um, it was playing right now in the Denver Art Museum as we speak with this like freeze of photographs around it. So it's a lot of fun, totally unexpected, um, really fun. So I'll stop there and with time for questions, hopefully. Thanks. These are wonderful students whose work you've been seeing. Paul Geimer, Riley Finnegan, Aaron Jensen.